the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, you've been having us read a book called First Principles with John Taylor. John Taylor, of course, has advised presidents all the way from Ford, Carter, Reagan. He was part of the Treasury during the Bush administration. You know, he knows Greenspan. He is he was a friend of Milton Friedman. I mean, you, you can, it goes on and on, but this is a man who actually has applied economics to politics. And I think that's one of the things that we continue to look at as we try to understand the issues in play today right. is this interface between economics and politics, between finance and economics, to not look at these as individual fields but to see the overlap. And while John Taylor is a professor of economics at Stanford today and has been for a long time, it's not just economics that's in play because economic policy ends up driving so many other things that are near and dear to our hearts. Yeah, and the thing is, David, I think probably to be able to advise that many presidents or be around that circle, you've got to sort of come at it with a nonpartisan approach. And he seems to do that. He tries to apply his principles. He's laid out five principles, and they apply to what we've been talking about. You know, he wants to see predictability in the market. You know, he wants to see market forces take action. You know, he wants to see the rule of law, a smaller government. But if you're going to do that, you have to meld and, and learn to adapt to whatever administration's in office at the time. It is remarkable that when you look at things that may seem non-interesting in terms of a topic over the dinner table or whatnot, I mean, just very sort of academic or, or obtuse questions, these are the questions that end up determining the course of our country, the course of our economic policies, the way we do business or do not do business, whether or not we go into a growth cycle or remain in sort of an economic malaise for an extended period of time. So, as trivial as they may seem for the person who's just going about their life, trying to live it and make ends meet, these are the issues which will determine what our life looks like circa 2014, 2015, 2016. And it's certainly not trivial when you're talking about it being an election year. We are going to see policies implemented over the next year, two, three years that will be affected right now by how people vote. Well, again, we've been discussing discretionary policy measures versus rules. We've been discussing the credit markets. And, of course, a part of the credit markets is, is interest rates. And today I'm sure we'll venture into the Taylor Rule where interest rates, inflation, and projected interest rates where they should be as set by the Federal Reserve Board. All of these things uh, we'd like to explore with Dr. Taylor. Yes, David, you've talked about the Taylor Rule before, and as simple as it sounds, it really is a guideline for central bankers as to where interest rates should be. Joining us today is John Taylor, uh, author of First Principles and professor at Stanford University, professor of economics. We want to look at a couple of things today. First of all, the policy issues which are in play that will determine the course for us as a country over the next two, three, four, five years, and there is a lot at stake. Um, John, perhaps you could sort of define that precarious place that we are and perhaps uh, the way you see policy as a positive. Uh, do we have a positive outcome potential? Is there inevitable demise, as some would suggest? And what really is at stake here? Well, we certainly have the possibility for a positive outcome if we make the right decisions and take the right policies. Recently, we haven't been. We've moved to a situation where fiscal policy has led to increasing debts with high deficits. We have a situation where I think regulation has increased quite a bit. The, the policy has become quite unpredictable with stimulus packages and actions by the central bank in terms of large purchases of securities. I think that we have evidence that uh, a better approach is out there, and that's the approach that was followed for the most part in most of the 80s and 90s until we got into this mess. So we can get back to that. It's a new world. It's a different world, but the principles have not changed. Let me key in on one word that you mentioned, because unpredictable is something that the market really doesn't know what to do with. And this goes back to monetary policies, which to some degree have been rule-based at periods of time in U.S. history, and then at other periods of time have become very discretionary. And the market just doesn't know what to do with being unable to anticipate the future. If they can anticipate, if they can plan, now you're talking about business execs, CFOs, CEOs, COOs, who are willing to say, okay, I understand the regulatory environment I'm in. I, I understand the tax environment that I'm in. 
and here's how we're going to invest. Do you see the current sort of discretionary policy measures versus the rules based of yesteryear as being a real problem? It's a serious problem, and it, it is unpredictability that's the symptom of the problem. We have large segments of our tax code that's uh, up for grabs, up for renewal now each year. Uh, over 100 provisions are up for change, for example, compared to maybe half a dozen or 10, 10 years ago. So it is much less predictable. Monetary policy uh, was following more rules-based policy, as you say, in the 80s and 90s until this crisis began to flare up. And I think early 2005, six, you began to see it. And so that's why I think there's a great deal of hope that we know what works. We know that these kind of rules-based, predictable policies based on the rule of law work, and we can apply these principles, I call them, to our current environment in a way which will increase economic growth and reduce unemployment and um, get America to a more prosperous situation. Again, keying in on that one word, unemployment, you certainly have fiscal measures and stimulus which have been put into the system. On the monetary side, you've got the dual mandate and one, price stability, two, limiting that unemployment number. And it seems that QE1, QE2, the operation twist, it's not getting the Fed what it wants in terms of the kind of improvement that they would want in, in the unemployment number. Are we likely to see continued discretionary monetary policy? Are we likely to see continued stimulus? Since we haven't gotten to that number, what might that look like? And perhaps you could just reflect on your view of the single versus dual mandate. I think right now monetary policy has gotten very interventionist compared to uh, again, 80s and 90s until recently, that's the, as you mentioned, quantitative easings, which have increased the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet to levels that have never been seen before. It's completely unprecedented. And people don't know how that's going to get resolved. The ideal for me would be the Fed lays out a plan to gradually reduce that uh, overhang in a predictable way so people know what's going on, but they begin to do it sooner rather than later. That would, I think, be beneficial to the economy. In terms of the dual mandate, uh, that's in the law that the Federal Reserve must both achieve maximum employment and price stability. I think it's been detrimental. It was put in the law in 1977. Uh, it made things worse for a while. Paul Volcker came in as chairman of the Fed starting in 79 and interpreted that dual mandate in a way which let him focus on price stability. Um, more recently, the dual mandate has been come back in favor as a rationale for the quantitative easing and other interventions. So in my view, it would be better to remove that dual mandate, uh, at least to put the law where it was before 77, or at least say that the Fed should focus on price stability, because I think that would lead to a more predictable, more effective policy and actually would reduce unemployment in a way which may seem surprising to people. You look at sort of your principles in these first principles, predictable policy framework, the rule of law, strong incentives, reliance on the markets, and, and a clearly limited role for government. And that last point, a, a limited role for government, as a share of GDP, we've seen government grow from 7% to nearly 40%. In the last five decades, we've seen a combination of both public sector debt and private sector debt grow from $1 trillion to 50 trillion. And at this point, the private sector is not expanding its debt. And the government's stepping in and filling that gap to the tune of about 8% of GDP. We don't have a clearly limited role for government. It would seem that the trend of the day is, in fact, that it's expanding its reach. And how would you suggest we address that? Again, because it is private sector solutions and it is, it is the market that seems in the past to have uh, created very innovative solutions and growth. So how do we step back from this government prop, if you will? I think that people have to recognize the importance of limiting the scope of government. The government has an important role, but it's gotten too big. It just very recently, just the federal sector has gone from 19.5% of GDP to 23 24% of GDP. That's a gigantic increase just since 2007. So it's very important to get this back to reasonable levels. And I think that there's other areas where the scope of government has increased. Uh, regulations of, the, of various 
financial side that were put in place after the crisis, I think that some of them have nothing to do with the crisis. We're regulating payday loans and things like that. And uh, those seem to be as many others. They have nothing to do with the crisis, and there's more regulation. I think the new Health Care Act also has lots of regulations. And, of course, that's moving away from the market system. So we, we have so many ways in which we've deviated from the five principles that I've tried to articulate in my book, but we know how to get back to them. So just to answer your question again, people understand why they're important, number one. Number two, they elect leaders who they think are they're going to bring these principles into play. And then number three, they help the leaders in the sense of look at what they're doing to make them accountable. And that's what we've seen has worked in the past, and it will work again in the future. In the issue of there being provisions up for grabs or things that are changing in the tax code, I assume one of the things you're referencing is the expiration of the tax cuts from the Bush era. Is this a foregone conclusion? What are the implications, do you think? And our primary concern here is that as we look at the 2013 Obama budget, there is this increase in revenues via an increase in taxes, and yet we're still penciling in a one33 trillion dollar deficit. And I'm just wondering if there's that much of an increase in revenues, exactly where's that money going? And and are we really moving anywhere closer towards a balanced budget or anything that looks like fiscal responsibility? No, because because spending is increasing in that budget so rapidly. It's not an exaggeration to say that spending is a major source of the problem now. And I think it's very important to get that spending growth under control. It's not really even cutting spending. It's just preventing it from rising so rapidly, which is what's happening now and is projected to rise in the future. So in my view, we should not be raising taxes or making the economy slow down on the basis of higher tax rates. But what we should be doing is looking for tax reform, making the tax system more efficient to encourage economic growth, and also at the same time removing the unnecessary programs that have expanded so rapidly very recently. If you had the ear of the next president, whoever it may be, and you have had the ear of past presidents, if there was a singular bit of advice, what would you start the conversation with? The principles that I outline in my book would be a preamble. There's no question about it because there there makes so much sense. So uh, we need policies been unpredictable. The rule of law has been deviated from. We need to fix those two things. We've got to have more emphasis on on the market system and incentives and, and limiting the role of government. But then the deal is how do you apply those? Those are abstract, if you like, more academic. They're extraordinarily important. But how do you apply those principles? And I would start with the budget. We have a gigantic budget gap. We have a deficit. That it's getting larger, the debt is exploding, and so take that into account. I have a plan to do that, which is is not draconian, it's not austerity, it's just common sense. And I would go to monetary policy. You mentioned the dual mandate, unwind the programs that we've currently put in place, get back to a more normal kind of monetary policy and, and regulatory policy, uh, same kind of thing. Try to pull back some of the extra regulations that have been put in place recently. And I think in all these cases, it's pretty straightforward what you do. A uh, person's got to be committed to it. It has to have people around him or her that will do these things. And, and that's what I would urge, is the, the, the principles and the people who will deliver on the principles. One of the things that you note in your book that it was not without pain that Reagan and Volcker in tandem implemented a number of these principles. And, and although there was an increase in unemployment following Volcker's actions, he had the support of the Reagan White House. I guess that's what you mean by taking a principled approach and sticking with it. There can, in the short run, be a, a cost to that. Yes, yeah, sometimes you just got to get started. And the courage that uh, Volcker had and the support from Reagan were essential here, and, and the end result was much lower unemployment. It basically had to get started reducing that inflation rate, get back to a monetary policy was was much less interventionist than in the 70s. And the fact that the president of the United States supported the chair of the Fed in these actions was so important in the past presidents would be urging the Fed to back off, to lower interest rates, to stimulate the economy, and it's always was counterproductive. And this this time, Reagan supported Volcker, and, and that's what it takes sometimes. It's not just having the principles, it's having the courage and the wherewithal and the knowledge about how to apply them in practice. I think one of the fascinating things that I appreciate about your dialogue in the book is that 
you really point out that ideas matter. And you look at these different schools of thought that have influenced the Council of Economic Advisors, the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and you can tie it back to a theoretical framework, a system of belief, wherein certain schools hold to a very Keynesian approach. And having studied those schools, having done your Ph.D. work at those schools, it's almost like a cookie-cutter approach. You're probably going to be of the belief that intervention is the key. Or, on the other hand, you know, you, you would probably cast the Chicago school as, as, as different than that. But ideas matter. If you could focus on one idea in that conversation with the president, the next president here will elect in November, what would be the one idea? I mean, you focused on economic freedom as one of the core ideas in this book. Would that be the gist of the conversation? Absolutely. Uh, that wraps it all together in a way that I think most people can understand. It, it takes us back to the founding principles of our country, which is based on freedom and, and economic freedom. And when you think about that term sounds a little vague, but it's really what's made America great. We've had uh, so much better uh, progress and success here than other countries. The rule of law, for example, the f focus on markets, and uh, other countries have followed us, and when they've done, they've done better. We're drifting away from it now. Uh, we're policy is much less predictable. Uh, we, we talked about that. The rule of law is getting violated in ways that uh, are clear when, when certain favored people get benefits compared to others. And so economic freedom would be the key. I, I really emphasize, though, that there's things like steady as you go. There's terminology, long-term thinking. There's terminology like being predictable that are, go along with a good framework for providing economic freedom to people. And, and I would urge that, too. You, you're always so tempted when you're in office or in a position of responsibility to try to do things which may look good in the short run, but they end up being very harmful. So steady as you go, predictable, or, or kind of the buzzwords or concepts that I think should be part of the discussion. On occasion, our listeners will listen to a CNBC pundit or an academic mention the Taylor Rule, and lo and behold, this is your rule. You've basically devised a way of, of figuring out where interest rates should be. Maybe you can explain that a little bit and, and suggest where interest rates should be. We had Operation Twist under the Kennedy administration in the 60s. We have Operation Twist today, which is essentially a manipulation of interest rates, uh, a changing of where the yield curve is, whereas it would be at a different level. Where should rates be following the John Taylor rule? The rule is a guideline for central bankers to use to determine where they should set their interest rate. It's very straightforward that the guide says when inflation picks up, then the interest rate should rise by a certain amount. When the economy goes in a recession, the interest rate should fall by a certain amount. And the terminology by a certain amount is very important because the rule says how much the interest rate should change. And that's why I think it's become interesting and useful, quite frankly, to many central bankers around the world when they're making their decisions. Monetary policy is a very tough job. If they have a guideline like this, it helps. With respect to your question about where rates should be now, I think they should be moving into positive territory. I, I'd say it's there now, by the way, the federal funds rate is between zero and 0.25, so effectively zero. I think it'd be wiser if the Fed started to move up towards 1% at this point. That's what the Taylor Rule would suggest, and that would allow the money markets to function a little better. And I think it would also get us in a situation back to the kind of normal policy that we've had in the past. Whether you call it a Taylor Rule or some other, something else, the message of history is clear. When central bankers have been close to this kind of a policy, policy principle, things have worked well. When they deviated, things have not been so good. Now, it's interesting because there's areas where you respect what Volcker had done in the past in terms of monetary policy, and looking at how he would have, using his model for calculating inflation, would have calculated today's current rate of inflation, the old model would be close to 10%, which might affect your Taylor rule in an interesting way, because obviously the current inflation rate that's being used is far less than that. The MIT Billion Prices Project would suggest somewhere between 6 and 6.5%, the old Volcker methodology, 10%, and 
and I'm pretty sure that we had real inflation. It wasn't a figment of our imagination in the 70s. But today, we're told, okay, 2 3%. What if Volcker was right, and inflation today is coming up on double digit? Then what would your Taylor rule suggest interest rates should be at? Well, if the inflation rate is 10%, you've got to have an interest rate over 10% to control the inflation rate. That's sometimes called the Taylor principle, by the way, that when inflation rises, you have to raise the federal funds rate by more than the amount by which inflation rises. So, heaven forbid we don't get into a situation of that kind or we're not already there, as you already said. But if it, that was the case, you'd have to raise rates quite a bit. And in fact, that's what Volcker did. When, when inflation got that high, he raised rates considerably. And a lot of people didn't like it, but that's what it took to get ultimately inflation down and ultimately interest rates down and ultimately unemployment down. The academic discussion today is sort of chain versus unchained CPI, and and the argument is actually that we're overstating inflation. It needs to come down uh, a number of basis points. And again, maybe that's just for the academics to sort out. But I look at the Kennedy administration's Operation Twist and and their buying of of long-term Treasury bonds and selling of of short-term Treasury bills. It's the same thing that we're doing today And we really don't have a clear reference point in the interest rate market. What are your thoughts on sort of this changing, or I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it fair to say a manipulation of interest rates? We certainly can't afford more than the 2% that we're paying on the national debt. So there's a clear motive to keep it low. Well, manipulation is the correct word. The Fed has inserted itself into the money market almost has replaced the money market with itself. Uh, It's pumped in so many reserves and the interest rate is now manipulated simply by deciding how much interest will be paid on bank reserves. It's it's not a market rate uh, in, in the sense the supply and demand is determining the rate. I think the Operation Twist of the 60s, I taught my students for many, many years that Operation Twist in the 60s didn't work. That was the conventional wisdom, by the way. That's what most faculty, most professors taught their students who taught the subject that Operation Twist didn't work. So it's quite remarkable that we move back to Operation Twist. It's like we just ignored all the things that have been done. And I, and what that shows to me is there's this urge to intervene. There's this urge to do something, even if there's experience that says it doesn't work. And and we've got to get away from that. Uh, and I hope that, you know, read books, my books, look at history. History is so important for understanding these things that so we won't make these mistakes again. The market rate is an interesting question. Is the market rate two percentage points higher? We've been able to manage that rate lower. And again, I appreciate your principle, the Taylor principle, the Taylor rule. But the danger is if inflation is in fact being understated, then we have a real issue with interest rates. And is it possible to see a Volcker come in and quote unquote do the right thing? Well, no, no, I would say the situation is quite different than when Volcker came in. And and I would say I'm not really quarreling with the measures of inflation at this point. It, we, there is debates about the core and about bias and headline and all that, to be sure. But I, I think that the inflation rate is low now, and partly because there's so much unused capacity. It may be picking up, but but I think I, I wouldn't expect uh, someone to come in and bring interest rates up to double digits like Volcker did. There's just no need for anything like that. There is need a need to start getting back to normal, which would be, as they had, just start to move the rate up a little bit. And if it's done, there'll be no reason to take it up to those high levels. That's not necessary if we get started on this now and, and fix the problems that have been created recently. Again, you're tying into rules, principles, predictability, behaving in a way that the market can say, we know that we're here and therefore action should be X, Y, and Z versus just waiting. I mean, literally, we are waiting to see what happens at the end of June when twist expires. When quantitative easing one and quantitative easing two expired, we had a 15 to 20% swoon in the equities market and then a 30% recovery, 30 to 40% recovery with the reinstatement of a new monetary policy. It's beginning to have a very negative effect in the markets in the sense that the markets are not moving on the basis of good, proactive, organic growth Instead, it's an anticipatory work to see what the Fed's going to say or do next. 
that's really not the basis of, of a strong recovery, is it? That's a serious problem, I think, that and cause no one really knows the impact of what the Fed is doing. A lot of people now, as you're referring to looking at the impacts on the stock market, we don't really know. And But what's worse is to the extent that people think the Fed's actions are having these effects on the market as distinct from fundamentals like profits and expected earnings, then we're in a situation where manipulation is the correct word. And of course, the Fed cannot manipulate manipulate so much that it determines the future of the stock market. At best, it can make these shorter-term movements, and I think those are even questionable. So there you have unpredictability, difficult predicting, noise in the markets, uncertainty that holds people back, and, and that's the problem we have right now. So to bring into focus what our point of dialogue should be, we're coming into the full swing in, in, in terms of the election cycle. What should the question be? What should the topic be? How do you direct the conversation productively to bring these issues to bear? Real decisions are going to be made. The votes will be counted. And we will have policymakers next year implementing someone's ideas. How do we try to shape the debate or influence the debate today? most important thing is to have a good substantive debate about these policy issues. This is a great opportunity this election year because there's really some quite different proposals out there, say on the budget. Just take the budget, for example. President Obama has submitted a budget. It's out there. It's it's been voted down by the Congress, but it's out there. We have a budget that the House of Representatives has put forth that's sometimes called the Ryan budget. It's at least passed the House. There are two conflicting, in a sense, two different visions. So the more people can understand the difference between those substantively and decide on which approach to take, the better off we'll be. And I, I think I think that the extent to which spending comes down more rapidly, the extent that we deal with the explosion of our debt, and those are dealt with, objectively speaking, better in the Ryan plan than in the administration's plan, then we can have a good debate about it. But I think it's so important that people look at a graph or, or look at the numbers or think of what people are saying, read a book. I know it's tough. In, a, in election years, focus on personalities and, and other issues, but this one is so important right now. I hope people do it. And that's that's the responsible thing for the citizenry to be doing. So if we step away from the sound bites and political cliches, we, we can certainly recommend First Principles, your book, the subtitle is Five Keys to Restoring America's Prosperity. If you were trying to draw a distinction between sort of the schools of thought and the basis that, say, the Obama budget versus the Ryan plan had in mind, what's the background way? How, how do you develop some clear thinking for someone who's not astute or read in these areas? What else would go on to that library shelf or onto that book list? Hey, number one, I would say, is what's happening to federal spending. In the last few years, from 2007 to now, federal spending has really increased tremendously, and it's expected to increase even more if we don't take some action. I think when people see those numbers, they're saying, what are we doing? Why did we raise spending so much after 2007, and do we have to keep it at those levels? And that's one of the biggest differences, I think, that people can latch on to and see. Another one is, is, say, a, a program like Medicare. Everyone realizes we need to control the growth of Medicare since it's exploding at this point. In the Ryan budget, it's done by using the market more and and giving people some opportunity to make choices. In the Obama budget, there's more of a central authority, uh, independent payments advisory board, it's called, that makes the decisions. So so there's quite a difference there on principles. Uh, One more market-oriented, decentralized, one more federal government-oriented and less decentralized. I think people can see that and, based on their experience, try to make a decision of which is going to be best for them and for the country. Well, there's a number of references in your book to Thomas Jefferson, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, and a number of his other books. There's, I think, the need for people to do some work, real hard work, intellectual heavy lifting, to better understand these issues and carry the dialogue. So we'll look forward to perhaps an, an, an update, and maybe the next time the update is being garnered, you'll be back in the Oval Office uh, talking to the president and advising again. So I uh, appreciate your time today and uh, your addition to our dialogue. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, too. Well, David, would that be an ideal if we could have more predictable policy and, and a return to the rule of law and you know reliance on the markets, strong incentives to rely on the markets, and really a limited role for government? I mean, those are the five principles that he's pointing out. They seem very simple, very common sense, 
yet we are wandering from it right now. Let me go back to that one title that I mentioned in the conversation today, and, and it's Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. Mm. It's been nearly 20 years since I was a TA for an American history class, and we had the flexibility of bringing in outside reading. That was a book that I wanted to introduce for, to, to everyone in the class. The Road to Serfdom sort of defined Hayek's view of what socialism looks like and how it grows through time and ultimately is unsustainable. In, in terms of its trajectory. So that, I think, is one of those first reads. It needs to be on every shelf. It needs to be well-worn, not because you bought it used, but because you've read it many times. Well, and in many ways, some of the people and the principles that we outline with our listeners actually come from some of those you know, source materials. It's almost assumed that a person has read some of the classics that lay the foundation. And this is a clear distinction between sort of what works in terms of market dynamics versus that idea of centrally controlled dominance in the marketplace. So yes, that would be at the top of our list in, if these issues are important and if you want to define the discussion points as we come into this election cycle with friends, family members, and colleagues. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, John Taylor. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.